Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our daily devotions on Thursday, April 28th, 2022. Here we are, April, coming to an end. Well, good morning. It is bright and sunny here in Wisconsin. 25 degrees as I was rolling out of the sack this morning. I don't know what the high is supposed to be today. See full forecast. Oh my, took over the whole screen, didn't ya? Well, let's see, feels like 25. Expect partly high of 51 today. We're looking at 51 in the big city of Irma today. So I'm recording today. Um, I forgot. And Bonnie reminded me last night that I have uh, my uh, bi-weekly, I guess you'd call it bi-monthly, um, Bible study at uh, Grace Lodge this morning, and um, there were two or three things I need to get ready before I go to that, so it uh, forced me into a corner to record this because I won't have time to do it right before I leave the house, um, which is what normally happens. So I'm recording today. Um, so I can't greet each of you individually, but good morning to all of you, um, you whether you're watching with us now or you're watching later today. I mean, I could... I could guess at who's out here watching. Um, I've done that before too. Sometimes it's kind of fun, but I won't. I won't today. I'll just say good morning to all of you. I'm glad you're here with us. Excuse me, to spend a little time in God's Word. Of course, by recording, it gets a little shorter too because I don't have all that greetings and, and things like that. So, which I, I kind of miss. I don't know. I hope you guys enjoy it when I do that. Um, Hope that's part of the reason you join. That's part of the community here. <clears throat> Otherwise, I can just record these every time, and it would be easier for me. Oh, would it? I don't know. I enjoy I enjoy when I know that I'm talking to you, right? Right now, I'm talking at you. I, I don't know if you're here or not, but when you're when you're there, it's kind of like you're sitting in the pew in the church, and I'm talking to you instead of at you. Of course, this was over two years ago, my personal devotional time that I just <clears throat> began sharing with the world. But that's okay. It's time in God's Word, and that's, that's good and helpful, uh, good, right, and salutary in the language of the church for all of us. I think that's important that the church has a language that is distinct or different from the language of the, of the uh, world, that we have some things that we use. You know, every field of expertise in our lives, every area that is, is specific has a, um, what do I want to say, has a, a language, a jargon all its own, right? If you work in the medical industry, you've got specific words. If you walk in the mechanical industry, you've got specific terms and ideas that you put forth that you use. And so I think the church is a, in addition to being um, the place where we meet God, receive his grace, and see and know him. It also is uh, one of our vocations, and, and in that it has a specific language. And I think that um, keeping that language separate from the world helps us, right? Um, when the language of the church becomes language of the world, it's no different than the world. Um, and then we fall into, into, a, into a scandalid zone, into a death trap of thinking that the church is just like the rest of the world, and it's not shouldn't be at least. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into this. Good morning again to all of you. Let's go ahead and get into this. Um, if you have a Lutheran service book, the hymnal of the Missouri Synod, you'll have page 295, daily prayer for individuals and families. <clears throat> and we'll begin there this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I'm going to turn the page here. A little drippy today still, I. Right? Allergy stuff is starting to come out, and I'm not sure the lorantidine that I'm taking is, well, is handling it. Our psalmody here begins 
Um, we're in Psalm. It's on a separate page. Oh, <laughs> the acrostic. Psalm 119, verses 25 to 32. Psalm 119, verses 25 to 32. <clears throat> My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me, and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness, I set your just decrees before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Glory be to the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <clears throat> When I, when I told of my ways, you answered me, teach me your statutes. You know, the whole Psalm 119 is about God's law, which I've told you many times that it is, that is uh, to the Hebrews, that is Torah, that is life. Um, but 119, the whole Psalm is about the Torah. Each one, a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, represents a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, of course, we read it in English, so what do we know? Um, but this one really talks. This one really talks about um, that that we struggle to keep that word and that law. Uh, when I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand your precepts, and I will meditate on you. My soul melts for sorrow. My soul melts away for sorrow. So then give me strength according to your word, right? And that's where our strength comes in our daily lives from, from God's word. If we try to, you know, Americans are so used to the, the pull, up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. Um, but our faith really teaches us to put our trust in the Lord and he'll pull up our bootstraps for us, right? He'll, he'll give us the strength we need for each and every day. And then knowing his word, having his word in us, his Torah, I will run in the way of your commandments because you have enlarged my heart. Yeah. Additional Psalm, Psalm 9. Yeah, we're not going there. Let's continue with Exodus here. Our reading from Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. I'm trying to decide if we skipped over some stuff here. Um no, yesterday was 24, 1 through 18, so I don't think we did. I mean, the Old Testament tends to repeat itself a lot, so the treasury of prayer sometimes selects verses without the repeats in them. Coffee's a bit bitter this morning. So Exodus 25, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram's skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and stones for setting, for the ephod, and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold, 
inside and outside you shall overlay it and you shall make it make on it a molding of a molding of gold around it you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet two rings on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them the poles shall remain in the rings of the ark they shall not be taken from it and you shall put into the ark the testimony that i shall give you you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth and you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end of one piece with the mercy seat you shall make the cherubim on its two ends the cherubim shall spread out their wings above overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings their faces to one another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be and you shall put the mercy seat on top on the top of the ark and in the ark you shall put the testimony that i shall give you there i will meet with you and from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony i will speak with you about all that i will give you in the commandment for the people of israel this is the word of the lord thanks be to god well i wonder <clears throat> um clear let me make sure this is updated and okay clear this screen and type in arc and see what i get here cat's block is on i'm going to just see here if i can find uh yeah topic study on the ark of the covenant and if i can scroll down here for media ah, here we go this this works this works let me put this up on the screen for you here yeah there you go there's the ark of the covenant overlaid with gold made of acacia wood overlaid with gold with the mercy seat on the top of it see this this here you've you got your poles that remain in it made of acacia wood but layered with gold the the golden rings uh, the cabinet that's then overlaid with gold they would have taken thin gold and hammered it onto the surface um, and then the the lid which is the mercy seat um, it might be this one might even be more ornate than it's supposed to be um, and the the two cherubim the two types of angels with facing each other with their wings and facing the seat with their wings spread amongst them and on top on top of this is where the presence of god would be this is called the mercy seat because it's from here that god would give his mercy to the to the people of israel and and so this this area here between the angels when when the <clears throat> when the cloud would settle into the tabernacle this is where god would appear to moses is on that on that mercy seat um you know, i think in the i think in the greek um the word becomes i want to say listerion um and and it is christ that becomes the listerion the seat of mercy the place from which mercy comes um let me look and see here if there's another uh what's this image here there are little tiny ones on the screen and there there we go this is this is probably oh sure this is um an image yeah it says up in the upper corner up here the seven trumpets of jericho this is the ark being marched around um the walls of jericho before they before they fell um <clears throat> and then uh what else is here there's that image there's that image what's this image they're so small on the screen without blowing them up it's hard to see them um oh that's just what is this oh okay it's a it's a it's a stone image of it 
Um, not, not helpful for us today. Uh, what's this one? Um, come on. Come on. Well, all right. Sometimes it argues a little bit here. Computers are not flawless things, you know. Oh, sure. Here's another scene of them progressing the Ark of the Covenant. This is this is just moving it, moving the Ark of the Covenant, the incense, which are the prayers to God going up before God as they as they move the Ark of the Covenant. I think this is probably well. Who knows what it actually looked like? You've got you've got Moses's description. <clears throat> um, the Ark actually uh, is taken up by God. I don't remember where. Um, uh, where it where it is in scripture that it gets taken up uh, but we won't we won't find it you know there's no there's no uh, let me go back to the regular camera here there's no Indiana Jones out there um, that's going to find the ark somewhere and then bury it in the basement of the Smithsonian or what or wherever it is that Indiana Jones hides it at the end of it um, oh you know what maybe here maybe here um, there's a whole article here. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no. The the arc. Um, I found it because I I stumbled across it in an article. Um, I stumbled across it in an article somewhere uh, that talked about the arc being taken up by God um, and being lost because <clears throat> it doesn't matter it's it, for Israel the ark became an object of worship well it was well it was the well well while it was the presence of the location of the presence of God in the tabernacle it could be not an object of worship but a, but a point of worship kind of like we use crosses and crucifixes um, a focal point um, uh, but but it becomes idolatrous the way that, that Israel handles it, and so God takes it away. Uh, does the same thing, I believe. He does the same thing with the. Um, yeah, I know he does. It's in the time of the kings. He takes away the, or he orders somebody to destroy the <clears throat> the serpent on the the bronze serpent on the pole because it becomes an object of worship. It becomes an, an idol, um, and he orders it destroyed. Um, because he wants his worship to be for him, not for objects, right? And it, the cross is not an object of worship. It's an object used in worship. Um, but when we look at the cross, we're not worshiping this, this thing. Um, we're worshiping what this thing represents. We, we look to Christ the crucified. Um, and this reminds us of, of Christ the crucified because it's, it's something that we would forget given an opportunity because in the human human mind it's so horrible um, to see, see a, a man pinned to a cross like that but in God's eyes this particular event is, is beautiful because it it's the salvation of mankind and we can we can have a talk someday about the the beauty of the crucifixion but um, the ark is is so so Moses tells uh, Moses the Lord tells Moses to go to the people and and take up a collection and and it's not it's not um, uh, it's not uh, what do I want to say? A tax. <clears throat> That's not even being put up by God as a um, thou shalt do this, right? It's not like, okay, go to everybody and take 10% or go to everybody and demand this. It's it's take up a contribution, a free will offering um, from every man whose heart, whose heart moves him, right? So it's more the way we treat our offerings today. Um, our contributions today to the church um, that, that out of the out of the love that Christ has shown us we respond uh, with love for him and trust uh, for, to fulfill that which we don't have right so go to all of them and, and this is what you're gonna get you're gonna get precious metals precious stones um, for for uh, beautifying things you're gonna get you're gonna get um, the hair and the skins of animals to be used here uh, in the in the tabernacle, the building, you're going to get um, linens, material again, more construction materials uh, for a tent. Um, you're going to get oil for lamps, spices for anointing, 
incense, uh, more precious stones uh, to make the garments. And, and they're, you're going to use all of this to build me a sanctuary. Um, I don't think we are actually going to read, oh, let's, let me look here once, about the building of the sanctuary itself. Um, no, uh, we're going to jump over, and that gets quite tedious to read. If you want to, just pick up at, at um, Exodus 25, verse 23, and read through chapter 30. Uh, so five chapters on the construction of the tabernacle and everything that goes in it, right? You just keep reading, um, and, and you'll get that whole process. Okay, make the tent poles this big, make this many of them, make the bases for the tent poles this big and then this big, and make the stakes from this and make the sides from that and make them this color and that and make the make the vessels and the spoons and the bowls. And So, you, you know, we're not going to read that. It would be fun to read that. We're not going to read that. No, it wouldn't be fun to read that. It's like reading a schematic to build. The interesting thing is, though, God is very specific in his language, right? He's not giving them a blueprint, right? Today in construction, what you do is you'd go to a you'd go to a draftsman or an architect and they'd draw you a blueprint and in the blueprint would be the structure of all the walls and the uprights and the foundation and um, Bob Stoick, if you're listening, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the roof material and then the probably the electrical and the plumbing and the HVAC and and uh, all of that would be included in, in the drawing. And you have all the structure. But here, God has to transmit to Moses how to build this tabernacle with words. That's why the descriptions are somewhat repetitive and dry. But if you're trying to transfer the idea of something to somebody in a very precise way, it takes a lot of words. It takes a lot of words. And in our modern age, in, in here in the here in the two thousands, right, where our attention span is not that long, um, and and thanks to uh, television, and radio, things like Twitter, um, it's like show me a picture, or give me one hundred and forty words or less to whatever you're doing. And, and that's it, that's all I want, right? I want I want five minute increments, I want maybe seven and a half I can handle, but beyond that, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and don't repeat yourself, just tell me what you gotta tell me and get done, right? Which is often the way I write my sermons. I just tell you what I gotta tell you and I'm done, right? <clears throat> um, some older pastors write their sermons and they're repetitive because they, they were taught differently. When I was at seminary, we were we were taught, we were instructed to write for 20 minutes plus. Um, but I don't know of many pastors anymore that preach for 20 minutes um, or could hold your attention. There are people. If you ever listen to, to some of, well, you know, great speakers. Um, I listen to Jordan Peterson once in a while, and, and I can listen to him for hours. Um, sometimes I fall asleep. Um, but I can listen to him. He's got a lot of videos on YouTube that are over an hour long, and I, I'll listen to him beginning to end. Sometimes I have to do it in pieces because I don't have that much in you know, a block of time. I'm off topic here. So go get the offering. Go get these contributions to build this, and then I will show you concerning the pattern, the tack, and tabernacle, all its furniture, and you'll make it. You'll make it. This will be a dwelling place for God. This will. This is where he will come and be amongst his people, right? And, and that's what's going to happen. Well, I think we'll see that during during their travels. They, they pack up the tabernacle. Um, well, how do, where do I want to start? I want to start with their moving, right? When they came out of Egypt, there's a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night guiding them. They follow that. Um, when that pillar stops, they set up the tabernacle. And once the tabernacle is set up and everybody else is setting up their encampment, um, the cloud moves in and settles into the Holy of Holies. Um, I don't know if settles into the Holy of Holies where the Ark is located. Um, let's see here if I can get a... Well, here's, here's, what, the, here's what the tabernacle would look like. Um, the, oops! Ah! There. Here's what the tabernacle would look like. See the pillar of smoke here right in the center. Um, 1450 BC. Okay, so you've got, you've got this outer 
this outer tent. This is cloth. This this area around the outside is cloth. And then you come through the entrance curtain with your offering. See the the the. Oh wait a minute! I got to show it to you. Ah, wrong button. There we go. There we go. There we go. I'm trying to talk about a picture and I haven't shown you. All right, here it is. Here's the pillar of smoke. This outer ring is cloth set up as a as a fence, if you will. You enter through the entrance curtain here. Here's the bull, right? Here's a man bringing his offering. There's a bronze altar here. At these different tables on the side would be the would be the slaughtering place. Um, the blood of the animals would be offered on this altar. Um, the things, the offerings that are be, to be burnt would be on this on this bronze lav lavier. Um, and then there's the actual temple that, that's inside the tabernacle. Now that um, is laid out. I think this is a layout of it. Come on. Open up. There. Oh, why you open up down there? Um, let me just pull this up here. I'm asking an awful lot of my software today. Come on. Well, it doesn't want to do it. This. No, that's not it. Okay, I haven't got a. Oh, and it's locking up. Never mind. We're not going to do that because it's going to cause me all kinds of problems. Another day I'll show you the interior. So there's three areas. The area where everybody can, anybody can be, the area where only the priests are, and then the area where the ark is, which they only enter in once a year, the Holy of Holies. If you think about it in your church, there's the there's the narthex where everybody can be. There's the the, the nave uh, within the sanctuary. There's the nave um, wherein uh, um, the believers are, uh, the ones there for the service, right? Um, and then um, there's an area in the front where the chancel, uh, where the pastor is, right? And that's and then there's the area where the altar is. That's kind of the Holy of Holies. That's where God's presence is. Boy, so much for being shorter because I'm doing this recorded. Um, and that's where the ark is. And, and that's where God appears to Moses. So And that's where God dwells. So that pillar of smoke guides them. And when they come to a spot, they set up the tabernacle. The pillar of smoke stops when they set up the tabernacle. And the pillar of smoke settles into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and, and on top of the ark. And God's presence is seen there on the mercy seat uh, for, for Moses to come and, excuse me, come and speak with, to, to give the, his word to the people. And then when, when, God's decides it's, when God decides it's time to move on, because he's the one who makes these decisions, that pillar of smoke will rise out of the tabernacle and, and begin moving to the side in the direction they're going to go. And at that point, the, the, and God, in the in the instructions, God gives very clear instructions of who's to do what when we tear down the tabernacle, when we put it up, who handles what objects and what materials and and by by family. I mean, it's like like a military moving here. There's there's officers to do and soldiers to do the work that are commanded. And and then they move until the pillar stops again. Then they set up the tabernacle. Pillar settles in, and they and they remain there for for a while. So then we got the whole Ark of the Covenant, and it's also called the Ark of the Testimony. I guess I'm kind of winding this up here. Also called the Ark of the Testimony. Testimony is a witness, right? So what's in the Ark? Um, Moses will be commanded to put the the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, into the Ark, along with an omer of the manna, which will never rot. Um, and I want to say the, the staff of Aaron, which sprouted. Now, we didn't read that narrative, but there's the, Aaron's staff sprouted leaves, and that's to be put into the ark also. Um, and the ark really isn't that big, two and a half cubits. And a cubit is the length from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your finger. That's how they measure it. So, so two and a half times the length of a, an adult man's arm. Somewhere, this is, this is considered to be somewhere between a foot and a half and 24 inches, just depending on which uh, understanding of cubit there is. Um, so let's say 18 inches, 18, 36, um, and half of that again is nine, so... Uh, 45, 45 inches long, uh, cubit and a half tall, cubit and a half wide. It's not that big. It's not that big. Um, and then the poles to carry it because you're not allowed to touch the ark. Um, later on in the time of the kings, you'll find out what happens if you touch the ark. Um, so they carry it by the poles. Why, why is this? How does this apply to us today? Well, this is the mercy seat. This is the place from where which God will meet out his 
word and his mercy to get to his people. And Jesus now is the mercy seat. He's the Listerion. He's the, he's the place we go uh, to hear God's word and to receive the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. He is the mercy that God has given us from his, from his seat. All right. Wow, Pastor, you sure milked that out. A lot of thoughts on these things, though. All right, let's look to our prayer of the day. Get, the, get, get this wound down. Prayer, let us pray. Oh, Lord, absolve your people from their offenses, that from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our frailty we have brought upon ourselves, we may be delivered by your bountiful goodness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Why am I setting that to the side? And we continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Oh, look, the hidden Jesus. And we are bold to pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our prayers for ourselves and others on this Thursday morning. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. As I begin a new day with you, search my heart, dear Lord, and purify my affections, so that I may love only those things that please you and may put you first in everything. Help me to overcome the temptations I will meet this day. Strengthen my faith so that victory over the devil may be mine to your glory. Keep me mindful of the sufficiency of your grace and let your strength be made perfect in my weakness. Give me the grace to guard against sins of the tongue and preserve me from thinking evil in my heart against my neighbor. Teach me the joy of walking the ways of your commandments and bless those who walk in your fear and favor. Watch over me this day when dangers overtake me and ward off any evil of body or soul. If afflictions are to come to me this day by your gracious direction, keep me humble and obedient to your loving will. Thanks be to you, O Lord God, for all your past benefits and for your promises of future mercy. Direct my day in such a way that I may learn to praise you better tonight for the favors of this day. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, who is the mercy of all, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would comfort those who are sick or suffering or ill or in need of, well, or in need of comfort and assurance. Especially this day, we pray for Larry, Peter, Karen, Olive, James, Pat, Lois, Don, Brianne, Ashley, Susie, Bob, and all those who call upon your most holy name. May they receive the comfort that comes and the peace that is without, with, that passes all understanding through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things on this day, when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have 
no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, it is 7.13 a.m. on Thursday, Central Time. I got to get this uploaded so it's there for you at 8.25, and I got to get other stuff I got to get done so I can go. So God's peace be with you, and we'll be back here tomorrow, Friday morning, uh, live for our daily devotions together as we continue to explore uh, the book of Exodus. God's peace be with you. If I can find the button, there we go. God's peace.